first hybrid Tuesday talk we've ever done, and it's the first in-person component of a Tuesday talk we've done since 2019. Uh, so it feels really good to have everyone in the building and, and uh, see this room start coming up with, with folks and having our colleagues come by. So today we're going to be hearing from Melissa Wynn, Director of Photography for HistoryNet. She'll be talking to us about the Civil War Dead Letters Office and some photographs. Uh, I see you brought some physical stuff as well, which is always really cool. Um, before we get started, just wanted to uh, give you a couple of logistical things. Uh, I do apologize. This room is extremely echoey, as are uh, almost every room, all the rooms in the building. Um, we will try to solve that for next time and see what technology or things we can get to try to reduce the echo. If you uh, have any questions while you're watching the stream, if you're in the chat, go ahead and put them in the chat for us. Afterward, we'll have some time for Q&A. If you're in the building, pull on your questions to the end and we'll, we'll do everything together. Um, and if you have any other issues during the stream or you get kicked out, anything like that, we are recording this. It'll go up on YouTube shortly after the lecture is over uh, sometime this week. And uh, you can also uh, email us with any issues that you have in the front at museum.dar.org. And then finally, just wanted to say there's a couple of events coming up. If you're in the area, we have some cool stuff happening in the museum over the next two months. On January 28th, we're having a day to celebrate Lunar New Year. This year, uh, for the holidays, we decorate all of our period rooms on the second floor with different holiday celebrations throughout the winter. One of them is Lunar New Year, celebrated by China and other state countries like Korea. And uh, we didn't decorate it. We had the Asian Fusion Gallery, Art Gallery, come and decorate it for us. And it is gorgeous. It's so vibrant. It's very red and gold, of course. Uh, and they're going to be coming in and having a whole event. We're going to talk about Lunar New Year and the cultural celebrations of an impact. It's going to be really for a day. It'll be January 28th. And then the weekend of President's Day, that Saturday, we'll be open and we'll be doing some stuff for families. We'll have some different presidential themed activities and coloring sheets. And I think it's going to be really fun, too. So if you're looking for something to kind of help cure the winter board and winter blues. Those are two events to look forward to. And these Tuesday talks, we do every second Tuesday of every month. You can go to dar.org slash museum to see the schedule coming up for the rest of the year. Most of them will be hybrid like this. So if you're in the area and you'd like to attend one, we'd love to have you. I think that's everything. So without any further complication, there's no slip. Yeah, I'm gonna give you the clicker and I'll, uh, I'll share your PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Melissa Wynn, and I'm the Director of Photography at HistoryNet. Uh, we are a publisher of magazines, history-related magazines. Um, we have nine different magazines, all related to history, two military history magazines, aviation, Wild West, uh, World War II, two Civil War, time, uh, Civil War magazines, Civil War Times, and American Civil War, uh, Vietnam, get something, <laughs> but uh, that's about it. So, uh, um, and I specifically uh, manage the photo research department, but my background uh, mostly is in journalism and writing. And I also work on the Civil War titles sort of uh, editorially as well. So I first became interested in dead letter office images, which I'm gonna speak to you about today. Uh, a few about five years ago at, at a talk that I was at, um, one of the presenters there, uh, Kurt Luther from Virginia Tech, was working on a photo sleuth sort of um, technology. And in his talk, he talked about these dead letter office images. And as you'll see when I talk about them, the whole idea of them is also its own sort of sleuth mystery, which I think is kind of neat, neat and interesting and the images uh, therefore are sort of haunting. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about those. I'd like to thank the DAR Museum for letting me come and do that. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, the Dead Letter Office I'll talk a little bit about was a post office in DC. And these images were all enclosed in soldier letters that ended up at this Dead Letter Office. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the photos, the Dead Letter Office, and um, what transpired with them and where they are now. So um, a little bit of background. Um, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, you've got all of a sudden hundreds and thousands of men off to war. They're really not accustomed to being away from home. Many of them are pretty young. Uh, my oldest son is actually 19 and he's away at his first trip this weekend. <laughs> and even I'm like, oh my gosh, um, you know, 19 is still pretty young, 18 is young. Some of these for kids, they were 17 years old. Uh, they're not really accustomed to being away from home or that sort of stifling loneliness. There's, lots of them are stuck in camps. 
And so they're writing letters home. So you've got hundreds of thousands of letters now in a mail system that was really not prepared for it. Uh, there's also a couple of um, sort of circumstances of the time period that also affect the mail, uh, including some postal requirements, postal requirements that I'm going to talk about, and the seceded states. Uh, now you've got a bunch of uh, federal post offices in states that no longer are recognizing the federal post office. And in 1861, in May, they actually will no longer function in the seceded states. And you have mail there that's not really being delivered. So you've got also these young men are not accustomed to writing letters and they might not know how to address letters and they are uneducated, uh, not to the standards that we are today. You know, they don't go to high school all the time or uh, so they might, their letters might be illegible as well. So there is a post, so let's see if this works. <laughs> Oops, okay. Uh, so a little bit about the dead letter office. So these uh, illegible uh, letters, ones that cannot make it through the mail, they end up at what is called a dead letter office. Uh, this was established in 1825. So this is a phenomenon that had, of course, always existed. People uh, couldn't read the letters. Uh, you know, they put a little post office box or something, but they don't remember to put the city or the state on it and uh, also some posting requirements. So they would end up at this dead letter office in DC. Um, it was really just designated to investigate undeliverable mail. So the clerks that worked there were actually uh, granted by Congress the ability to open the mail. This is kind of where the sleuthing aspect of it comes in to go through the mail and investigate the letters in order to figure out uh, clues. They weren't really supposed to read the whole letter or anything, but you know, to get some clues from what the contents of the envelope or the letter itself to get these letters to their intended recipients. Uh, so the clerks that work at the dead letter office were typically retired clergymen, as this picture sort of depicts, or women. They were kind of thought to have a sort of uh, moral superiority that they could be entrusted with people's private mail. Uh, some of these contents in the letters, of course, too, were uh, monetary value. Uh, they had an entire system set up that uh, the monetary value, they were called money letters, um, would go through a system of checks and balances so that nobody would steal the contents of these letters. It was really just intended to try to decipher some new information from the contents of the envelope or the letter to help push that letter through to its intended recipient. Um, I actually read a, a book about the dead letter office. There was a woman who had worked there who said a money letter has five different records before it leaves the dead letter office and is so checked and counter-checked as to make collusion or abstraction almost impossible in case any soul who surveyed it were fatally tempted. Um, items like advertisements or circulars, those would kind of just be trashed. Um, they would you know, be disposed of in some form or fashion. Uh, but anything that was of uh, you know, sort of a, a sentimental content or anything, they would really hold on to those items and again, try to deliver these uh, to their intended recipients. Um, a little bit about some of the postage requirements at this time that impacted this dead letter office. So you can, again, imagine that before the Civil War, the dead letter office, it's busy, but now you have hundreds of thousands of people, again, off to war, writing letters. This, um, the dead letter office has suddenly got lots of more volume to deal with. And there were a couple of postage requirements that also impacted because uh, some letters that did not have the correct postage would also just be, you know, hurried off to the dead letter office. Um, in 1861, uh, well, in 1856, before 1856, uh, you could send a letter through the mail without postage on it, um, sort of like a collect call. It would, you know, end up at the recipient's, you know, postage or post office, and they would be, the postage would be due upon receipt. In 1856, there's a, a 
law that's passed a new posting requirement that says anything you put in the mail has got to have its postage already paid for and on the envelope. And this is a brand new requirement uh, that people weren't really aware of. And um, so you can imagine that there are many soldiers off the war who've never sent a letter or might not be aware of this new rule. Um, it's only a few years after that fact. Uh, they really start trying to enforce this rule as a way to sort of uh, curtail the amount of postage, the amount of research that these other post offices have to do. They're, they try to sort of, you know, put this into one spot. So on May 1st of 1861, a new post office regulation sort of eliminates this uh, idea that postage can be held. Uh, if you did put your um, mail in the, you know, post office, the postal, you know, and didn't have postage on it, it would be held for postage and after a period of time would be sent to the dead letter office, they would try to at least um, figure out where it was intended to go. But in 1861, there's so many of these and they're really trying to uh, in, enforce compliance with this law, they eliminate the help for postage rule. And any letter that does not have postage immediately is delivered now to the dead letter post office. Um, you can imagine this becomes a stifling amount of postage of um, you know new letters at the uh, post office at the dead letter office. And in his uh, 1861 annual report, Postmaster General Montgomery Blair writes, "By immediately sending this class of letters to the dead letter office." It was expected that a proper compliance with the law would be enforced, but so far from this being the case, the number after one year's trial exceeds 10,000 each month, and the attention they require imposes considerable additional labor and expense on this department. Um, in 1862, the third assistant postmaster, General Alexander Zeppeli, seeks to curtail this issue a little bit with the idea of soldiers off at war with the, their letters. So he creates what you see in the upper uh, right corner there, a soldier's letter stamp. So if, if you were a soldier and you were sending a letter and you didn't have the correct postage here, they would put the soldier's letter stamp on it and move it through the you know, pre-1856 rules where the recipient could pay for it upon receipt. Um, that helps to curtail it a little bit, but of course, there's still a cycling amount of posted of uh, you know, letters ending up at this dead letter uh, post office. Uh, at the same time as the Civil War um, begins, the it's sort of the infancy still of photography. Uh, it's only been in the United States about a decade, and um, the so. There's some new advancements in photography as well that really sort of skyrocket the popularity of the use of photographs uh, by Civil War soldiers, especially. Uh, on, this, on this, you can see there's a tintype on the left and on the right is what's called a carte de visite or a carte de visite. Um, this, these were new processes of photography that made them much more inexpensive prior to uh, the use of these and the uh, photographs would be on glass plates and it was an expensive process. These are the materials for these are much more inexpensive. And so the photography really becomes much more accessible to the common citizen at this point. And of course, now you also have this population of men off the war who want to document their photograph as a participant in this war and they want to send their photos home. And the, the image on the right, the part that you see. This is the first time that a negative is used in photography. So these can be reproduced. Prior to this, every image is its own unique image. Now they can be reproduced and the carte de visite is sold uh, typically by the dozen and very inexpensively. They were almost, and they're the size of about a playing card, which is it's actually part of the museum's a calling card. Um, and they're almost like school photos, you know, when your kids get their, oh, when I was a kid, this, but you know, you get school picture signing you know, on the back and give to your friends. Uh, this is sort of uh, the way that they could use them as well. So soldiers would get these, they would send them to their family, they fit right, like just right up into an envelope, they're about that right size. Uh, so when the dead letter office receives these photos, or uh, uh, letters, when they're able to go through it, now they're finding these photos in the envelopes. And so some estimates had. Uh, by the end of the conflict, 
there's still 5,000, I've seen some estimates up to eight or 10,000 images still unclaimed. They were unable to be delivered to their intended recipients uh, for any purpose. You know, they weren't able to find out the address of, on the envelope or they just weren't able to sleuth out who these photos are, who these letters and the photos that were closed in them were supposed to go to. So um, what happens next is what I think a really neat story about the patriotism of people at this time still dealing with the conflict of the Civil War and really a credit to these uh, employees of the Dead Letter Office. Uh, third Postmaster General Alexander Zebley, he really, really becomes convicted with trying to get these Dead Letter Office images, the images that were enclosed in these letters, to their intended recipients. So he comes up with this sort of uh, ingenious idea uh, to put them in what is known at the time as the Dead Letter Office Museum. So you can imagine if you're opening up people's contents of mail, you're going to find some interesting stuff. So they did, and a lot of times nobody ever claimed it or they weren't able to deliver it. So in DC, attached to the post, uh, post office, and the Dead Letter Office was inside the post office, they had a Dead Letter Office Museum. It had quite a bit of postal history in it as well as if it's dealing with that, but uh, it also had some interesting artifacts, so we believe uh, loaded guns and even a skull uh, at the museum. So it was this sort of exotic attraction in DC as well. And Zebeli really seeks to almost crowdsource this information to get you know people to come in and look at these photographs and help identify some of the people in the photographs. So what he does is he takes these photographs and displays them in the Dead Letter Office Museum. He puts them on these panels and you can see this is one of the panels. Again, he's got nearly 5,000 of these at the time. Uh, he puts them on panels of 36 images each. There's uh, nine per row, there's four rows. Uh, what's really interesting is, and um, you know, he puts them on these brass clips and he numbers each one of them on the bottom left. I guess the letter, you know, the one's got to be hide it, but you can sort of see that he puts the um, a red new, uh, numeral on the bottom of each of these photographs. So if you came into the office, the office museum, the Dead Letter Office Museum, and you saw somebody that you knew, and I'm sure there are some, you know, regulations that you can't just say, hey, I know that guy, and you take this picture home, I'm sure you had to prove something, um, you know, you would be able to take that uh, person's picture. At the time, they would have a corresponding letter, and you would go home with it, and, and they would take, and on the board, uh, they would take off the brass clips, they would take the photograph off of uh, the panel and on the panel underneath of it, they would write the date that you claimed the photograph, who claimed the photograph and the identification of the person in the photo. So I've seen some of these panels uh, today that are still in existence and uh, some of them are you know, nearly empty. They've had you know, people come and claim them. There are many success stories, actually, that almost 2,000 uh, success stories uh, that I've heard of from, uh, that's about the estimate, uh, during its time at the Dead Letter Office. Um, I actually had a couple of names of some on June, according to one of the extant panels that I've seen, uh, on June 17, 1874, a Mr. F. Topling claimed the photo of Lieutenant S. Roderick of the 19th Iowa Infantry. On October 16, 1902, and again, I think this is what's really neat about this story. In 1902, they're still trying to get these letters and these photos back to the people they're supposed to go to. Uh, Edward Marsh of the 10th New York Battery claimed a photo of himself some 40 years after he placed it in the mail. So it's impossible to really say how many of them were claimed, but it is estimated to be about 2,000. Uh, at the same time, the Dead Letter Office begins to um, publish descriptive lists in the newspaper. Uh, they're, they're literally describing what these photographs look like. They're understanding that everybody can't come to Washington, D.C. to look at them. Uh, they start to work with some of the GAR, the uh, Veterans Organization of the Union Veterans uh, of the War. 
to um, you know to identify some of these. The, in the early 1890s, the photographs and panels are cleaned and bound into albums at this point. And um, they, they still exist at the Dead Letter Office uh, for, for a long time. And some of the panels are still hung up and then some of them are put in these albums. At that point, they, uh, the Dead Letter Office uh, was working with the GAR Lee Post in Philadelphia. The, that post actually inspects every single one of these photographs and removes all of them that had inscriptions and turns them over to the GAR headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, for further help identifying and delivering their rightful owners. I spoke with somebody um, when I was researching uh, a story. I wrote a story about these uh, for Civil War times. This is the magazine. This is one of the magazines from the History Net group. And, um, when I was researching it, I spoke with, there is still a post office museum downtown, and uh, Lynn, Lynn Heidelbaugh is one of the uh, historians there, I spoke with her about these efforts, and she said that they were extraordinary as well. She said they went above and beyond the standard operating procedure, and I think it shows how deep the scars of the war were for the United States, and that people were dealing with the aftermath very personally and in a very tangible way. Um, these efforts just keep going. Uh, well, now that they're bound in albums, many of the um, photographs are bound in albums, they start to travel them around the United States in, in another effort to try to get more eyes on these photographs. And uh, they go to all these little fairs. Um, at, at the Chicago World Fair in 1893, they were there. And they're sort of an attraction at these world fairs. They go out west. They're really trying to get new eyeballs on these images that people had maybe never seen before so that they can um, see if the Civil War left any claim. And there are also success stories from this. Um, at, at 1898 Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition in Omaha, Nebraska, the daughter of Civil War veteran J.J. Norman claimed her father's photograph, with, which had been sent during the war from Indianapolis to South Bend. Well, that never made it to South Bend, but uh, well, he, and he was serving with the 86th Indiana Infantry at the time. It had been in an exhibit at the Dead Letter Office for 35 years. A uh, reporter at that time wrote actually about this, um, these albums at the fair in the local newspaper said, quote, there's a melancholy collection from the Dead Letter Office, including two cases of photographs of soldiers which were sent and miscarried during the Civil War. Looking at them, I thought, how young were most of the faces? So the fairs offer some uh, new success stories, uh, but uh, of course, the further you get away from the war and the time period that these veterans are around, uh, they, the success stories are fewer and fewer. Uh, in 1911, the Dead Letter Office Museum actually closes, uh, mostly for storage space and costs. Um, the album of the soldier photographs still lingered at the Dead Letter Office for decades. Uh, and observers could still come in and ask to see it if they wanted to at this, at this time. It has obviously a, sort of a reputation of being there. Um, but by the 1930s, it had been placed in storage, and in the 1940s, during World War II, the government sort of decided to free up space and sell these images for the money. So they sold them to a couple of booksellers out in New York, and uh, those booksellers, in turn, put them up for sale, and a couple of photo collectors, Civil War photo collectors, uh, purchased, they sold them directly as the panels, too. Um, they just, here you go. So uh, some uh, collectors actually purchased the panels. There was one Phil Medicus who in 1948 bought a dozen of the panels and he uh, actually donated 10 of them to the George Eastman Museum. Although one that you can see today are all photographs of those panels that are there. Uh, actually at the time I was researching this, I thought there were four to six of them at the George Eastman Museum. I didn't have the correct number yet. And I called them and the lady was in storage going through it. And she's like, oh, I found them. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, I can't believe you're looking at them, you know? And um, she's staring at them. She's like, oh, there's 10 of them here. I was like, 10, oh my gosh, you know? So it's okay when you make it up there to see them. But 
Uh, but she was tired enough to send me the hybrid function uh, imagery of all 10 of them. So that was pretty neat. Um, there was also a, uh, this is actually one of the other tables that's on the front of the Instrument Museum. And again, you can see they have the brass clips, the numbers on them. Um, you know, as you can tell, this panel does not have any success stories on it. These are all photographs of men who fought in the war. Um, what I find really just fascinating about them, you can just imagine going to the Dead Letter Office Museum and seeing the walls covered in these men's photos. And that's the face of the war. These are these men are out there fighting, and they're just sending their photo, their image home. They're you know who knows what story they're sending home with them, and they just never made it. And uh, that's sort of why I call them unfair, interrupted um, sentiments. You know, they just never got to finish what they were intending to say. Um, so this is the uh, uh, this is the piano. There's another uh, collector, his name is Argus Ackworth, he's in the upper right, and his name is very synonymous with Dead Letter Office photos, if you're in the photo collecting world and, uh, and know anything about Dead Letter Office images. And the reason why is because uh, he actually lived in New York uh, for a while, and he was from Indiana. He had an ancestor that fought in the Civil War, so he was very interested in collecting. So he had lots of collections of uh, photographs and items, uh, and he was a meticulous catalog. So he cataloged every item that he owned, and every dead letter office photo that he owned has his name written on the back of it. So there you can see um, over there it says Argus Osborne, and it, they all have number 409, which clearly was his indication that it was a dead letter office photo. So uh, now some of these have come into circulation and you find that it's like, oh, I've got Marcus Osborne. You know, he's got his own life in this collecting world as well. He bought thousands of these also from that New York seller. Uh, he actually has a, sort of a tragic story where he had thousands of them. They were kind of stored in an attic. Of course, he had lots of collections of items and there was a fire in the attic and several hundred of these photos burned in that. So he decided to sell them off because he felt like he wanted somebody that could take better care of them. So he did um, sell them off. And there was actually um, a, a collector that's still around today. His name is Dave Taylor. Uh, his name is Dave Taylor. He uh, actually purchased uh, several panels. And in fact, he just put several of them up for sale. Um, they're very popular at this point among Civil War collectors. Uh, those panels sold last year for $10,000 and $8,000 uh, each. So uh, they have a real engrossing aspect to them. So um, when I spoke with Dave Taylor actually about his uh, collections, he actually said uh, you know, they were lost in the mail of the 1860s and never found their rightful owners. Uh, with any luck, today's owner will appreciate them as individual pieces of Civil War history that have finally come to us in their proper place. So these images are still floating around today. I'm actually going to pass around a few. Um, I own a few of them, and I will pass a, a few of them around so you can see. And again, when you look at them, I'm showing them to you, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you can see the markings from a brass clip. And the uh, red ink numerals on them. Let's start one here. So uh, they are still sold among collectors today, and um, they're you know, pretty popular at this point. So because they just have this really, I think, interior quality to them. I really think the sort of unfinished. Uh, story aspect of them is very touching. And uh, knowing that they, they have this whole history to themselves that they hung in this museum and all of these eyes came and looked at them is really endearing. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a success story that I had also with the dead letter of office uh, letters. When we when I wrote this letter, to, uh, the story for Civil War Times Magazine, uh, we were able to run, you know, a few of the, uh, lots of the 
photos and a couple of the panels, and but it's a print magazine, so it's a limited amount of space. And uh, when we put the, the story up online, we were able to run many more of those George Eastman panels online. And when it ran online, I got an email from a woman at the Ross County Historical Society who said, Oh, I saw your article, um, you know, about the death of her office uh, images. I was really intrigued by it. And then I thought, That one on the upper right hand corner, I know that guy. And I said, What? And so it's, she said, 1193, that's Abisha Downey. We have this photo in our historical society. No. Yes. So, um, so this, he, he was actually a soldier. Uh, he enlisted at, in April, on April 16th of 1861, after Lincoln calls for the 75,000 volunteers, Abisha Downey went and enlisted directly in the 1st Infantry, Ohio. And he, uh, for a five month term at the time, because of course everybody thought the war would be over by Christmas. Um, so he goes off to fight with the first Ohio infantry. He actually fights at the uh, first battle of Manassas or first battle of Bull Run. Uh, his unit is involved there. And uh, by fall of 18, he survives. Uh, although he has a really vivid account, they all have a lot of accounts of um, uh, his service there. He's sort of a local celebrity when he comes back, and especially. The 150th anniversary of the first battle of Manassas and the sort of 1861 Civil War. He's really well written about in the um, newspapers at that time in, um, in Ohio. So, and he's still alive at that point. So he actually comes back to Manassas and attends the 50th anniversary celebrations and stuff there too. Uh, after his five month enlistment is up, he actually re enlists in the 73rd. Uh, infantry and he survives the war. So uh, we were able to uh, inform the George Eastman Museum that we had identified one of the dead letter office photos. And so that was a pretty exciting uh, moment after researching and reading about them for years. And this, uh, to be part of one of the success stories was pretty cool. So um, these are a couple of these are floating around here. Uh, again, these are all images that are in my collection. Um, of Death Letter Office Museum photos. Um, you can see again, they all have, you know, the red ink numerals on the bottom left, and they, you can tell, identify that they only have the brass clips. Uh, once or twice, I've been really lucky and seen a photo in an antique shop that whoever was selling it did not know it was a Death Letter Office Museum photo, so it's a much less expensive than a Death Letter Office photo museum does for. <laughs> They didn't get up there, but um, those are sort of the telltale signs of what they are. So um, that is what I have. Uh, I will take questions for sure if you have any questions or. Um, so uh, if you guys have questions, and then I'll throw in uh, questions from the chat as we go. Yes. Um, I love you. So I have not found any African American soldiers and nor Confederates. Um, uh, so it's my understanding that some people have seen Confederates. I've not ever uh, identified it myself or had that verified. But no, I have not ever seen an African American photo either. And I actually asked the woman at the George Eastman Museum if there were any, and we looked through the panels, and there were none there too. So. That's not to say that there weren't any, uh, but I have never seen one. So that question was uh, if there were African American soldiers or Confederate soldiers in the Dead Letter Office, correct? Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, were there sometimes were there letters with some of the photos, and if, and if so, did anyone find it? But they also get them the letter too. I think when when they still existed at the Dead Letter Office and in the museum. The letters corresponded with them. So you could come in and the letter, the not numeral, claimed the letter and the photograph. I think at some point in this time, they became lost. I'm not even sure, though, if that wasn't as late as them selling it off to the New York um, booksellers. I'm not myself sure what period the letters become lost as, um, or not attached to the photographs anymore. But for the, when they were hanging in the museum, they were. 
work. And you, when you claimed that you would get the letter with the photograph. And really that was the original intention was to get the letter to the recipient, not just the photo. But eventually it just became the photo when they're found in the books and they go to fairs and stuff, it's just the photos. Yes. In your research, did you come across any of those letters that actually describe, I mean, verbally or, you know, in written form, describe the soldier? Because I'm looking at these and it's like, I'm not seeing anything that really separates one from the other. So how would they put that description in writing? Uh, I did see, I wish I had some examples, but yes, I did see some of the descriptions and I don't think you would really be able to tell much from those descriptions. Sometimes if, I don't know if I have any, really, if you can see, I'll show the camera first, um, on the backs of these ones, they have back marks. So there's descriptive, uh, this depends on where you force this after the fact, but there's descriptive writing on the back that might explain the photographer, maybe. Um, or give a mother who there's one who's in here that has to do that it's an idle soldier. So you have a bit of blue, so they would say it's an idle soldier, uh, back mark, this, young for you know, somebody like that. So they would look for identifying information, but it's a dummy. If you really start to describe some more soldier photographs, yeah, there's not much. Oh, the one thing I was going to say, actually, and this is sort of so this photograph is a good example, and I think has it up there, which I uh, forgot to talk about. But when you start to really study Civil War photography, uh, there's clues all over this that um, have to the you know common sense and whatever aren't really visible. But um, there's lots of clues in the cardstock as to the sort of the aging of it. But also, like the, this picture in particular has a backdrop. And this backdrop was only used at Benton Barracks. So they might say Benton Barracks for backdrop, uh, you know, soldier shown in infantry clothing. Um, you know, their uniforms would be all different depending on what part of the service they were in. Uh, you know, they might say, they might even try to describe his hair color or something like that. But there are other clues. Uh, based on okay. what accoutrements they had and stuff like that, that they would try to put into those descriptions too. But I do, don't think they probably have a lot of some six stories from uh, descriptions in the newspaper. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have, I think, three questions. Did the dead letter office overall go out of business? And um, after the Civil War, presumably the dead letter office was in business for a while, they must have found all kinds of interesting things, including photographs that were not Civil War. And then it's so interesting to hear you talk about the Civil War photos from the Dead Letter Office as an entity that could be studied. But then do historians also look at them as uh, primary sources so that they can um, think through other aspects? These are documents that they could then learn something about uh, the history of the time as well, or the history of photography, I guess, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so the, to answer your first two questions about the Dead Letter Office, it's actually still in existence in different forms. I think there's one in Atlanta right now, and I think there's one other. Uh, they're not actually in D.C. anymore, they're, and they're, I don't think they're even run by the government anymore, they're probably contracted out <laughs> most of the government, but um, they, it is still in existence, and actually I think that it's even called the Dead Letter Office still, but it no longer exists in D.C., and, uh, and yes, the museum itself, was open until 1911. So they still were finding many odd artifacts and still displaying a lot of that stuff. And again, I think they did try to uh, return as much of it as possible, but I'm sure they found a lot of other interesting stuff too. And I haven't actually <coughs> studied whether there's other phenomenons of dead letter office items or artifacts that have life of their own too. There probably are, you know. Uh, I would imagine even, you know, after, um, you know, World War II or any of the other wars too, they might have collections of some of those as well. I think it's a little, uh, the postal requirements and the, um, you know, secession, the breaking off of, uh, you know, half of the 
state or through the states or whatever within the its own federal postal system makes it a bigger phenomenon in terms of the war. But and of course, you know, stuff becomes <coughs> more legible. People use typewriters, you know, there were typewriters back then, you know, big people were using the camp and stuff. So um I'm not sure. I'm, I'm actually like research, so now maybe I'll look it up, but <laughs> you're just uh, giving me something to do tonight. So <laughs> uh, and then what was the third part? Um, it's so interesting to hear you um, talk about researching the um the civil war photos from the dead letter artists as you know objects themselves, but then I'm thinking it could be primary sources for some other investigation, something either about the history of the time or the history of photography. Yeah, absolutely. I think the dead letter office photos themselves are, but photography in general is its own has its own life of uh, research, and and definitely is a primary source. We've learned so much about the Civil War, or you know, any war really from photography, but the Civil War particularly because it really is the first photographic war, and you know, there's. Uh, Aside from the dead letter office photos, you know, the Library of Congress has these uh, photographs from Matthew Brady, these kind of famous photographers at the time, uh, who, you know, document stuff during the war, bring those photos back. And um, the government wasn't particularly interested in them then, but we are now. And there are these glass plates. Those glass plates are, they're phenomenal resolution. I mean, you just, no way you can get that kind of resolution off of digital or film, and you can blow those up so high, um, scan them in so high, you can really see a lot of details in them, and people have learned so much from the, the photographs. Um, again, like I was saying about how the different regiments had different uniforms, uh, different accoutrements that went with them. Um, it's really, it's neat. It's, you can lose your whole life to <laughs> study some more photography. <laughs> yes. Um, what about the letters themselves that uh, the photographs accompanied? Did you do any research or read any of those? I have not read any of them. I actually do have an envelope from one of them um, in my collection, but I have not read any of them. I don't actually know what happened to the letters uh, that accompanied them. Oh, so they were they were separated. At some point along the line, they're separated. I believe they're still with them as as long as they're at the Dead Letter Office Museum. But once they start traveling in the albums, they get separated. I think it's probably at that time that they get separated from the letters, and it's no longer about getting the letters to the intended recipients. But initially, the goal was to Include get the letter. The it, initially, the goal is the letter. It's. Right. And the photo is a part of that effort. But eventually, the photo itself becomes the effort. Yes. Yes. Kind of a stretch, but not that far from here is the National Mobility Museum, which was a Civil War pension building. Yes. Um, and you're running across any of this because there was so much issue when they were going to have a document, chicken widows, and document was going to you know, but they were in the war. Was there a year where I come past anything or maybe those photos were exhibited there or was there? Anything? I have not, but I would not be surprised if that was something that could happen. A lot of those pensions now exist at the National Archives, the pension uh, records from the Civil War soldiers. Uh, there, I mean, you can, anybody can go down and look through them and people have found photographs in them and they have found artifacts and other items in there as well. Because you're right, they had to really document they were related to this person, what was wrong, you know, what their injury was. They had to have letters from multiple people. And many times they, you know, sometimes they did have to have photographs, photographs of the injury or photographs that document that you knew who that person was, yes. I have not heard any, um, any of the pension holders having a dead letter office. Well, what are the pictures of panels? You said it was exhibited in DC? Yes. Do you know where it was exhibited? The panels themselves? You know, earlier, or... back during the war, during the Civil War, you know, that you said they were out. Were they, where were DC? So they were at the dead letter office when you see them. That was in the whole postal office, okay. which is now the Trump Hotel or something. Yeah. 
building something. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it was it was downtown here in that in that building. Yes. What are the and, questions? And that's where they displayed them. One of the questions from the chat uh, that you sort of touched on, but just to clear up, these are all portrait photos. Are there any collections of other types of photos or photos that are found with the letters? Yeah, the, um, the, the photos could be cards of disease. Most of them are cards of disease, but yes, tin types were included in those. Um, they did have tin types on. You could see uh, some of the Eastern panels have tin types on them as well. Uh, that's as far as I've seen. I haven't seen any glass plate imagery. <laughs> Yes. Um, if I if I were the kind of person who could use my cell phone in real time, I do it on Jack's chat. But what happens when you go to eBay or someplace like that right now? Do these things show show up? They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all gonna rush home and uh, yeah, they do. Sure. But <laughs> uh, yes, and I, I have actually purchased some of them on eBay. Yes, uh, that's actually where I purchased the. Uh, Envelope that I have as well. There's lots of collectors that sell on eBay and they sell a lot on um, Facebook marketplaces and stuff like that, or in show at shows and stuff like that, antique shows. That is where they turn up now um, in terms of being sold or bought. Yes. And I have purchased some of them on eBay. Yes. And you have to be careful on eBay. People sell fakes. But <laughs> again, another life of its own. But um, and I'm not going to have to know a fake from a real most of the time. So uh, it, it would be pretty hard to fake a dead letter off this museum photo, though, because it's, again, got these sort of telltale signs of the brass clips that were there, and it has the red numerals. There are occasionally, I have seen um, some that have the brass clips, and like the numeral has been worn off or something, just very, very rarely, like a sort of you know, movement away from this, but otherwise, no. Yeah. And I think that would be pretty hard to uh, fake. So, not to say people won't try. <laughs> They'll try anything. Are they so valuable that somebody would want to fake it? Uh, I mean, the, I say right now, on, you know, in on terms of what they sell for, a couple hundred dollars. Um, again, those panels that recently sold were. One sold for ten thousand, and the other one sold for eight thousand. That was at auction last year. Uh, so they have a value to them, and people seek them out. Uh, I don't know if a couple hundred dollars is worth it to somebody to try to fake it, but um, maybe. Any other questions? Super. So I'll just close off and then. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. We still have.